Problem 10 asks us to write a proof that f of x is equals 1 over x is decreasing on the interval 0 to infinity. And this is not asking us to use the derivative because when it says we need to, when we need to prove, this means we need to refer to the definition or a theorem. We don't actually have any theorems yet, so this is going to be asking us to look at the definition. So let's remind ourselves of the definition. The definition of a function decreasing on the interval of 0 to infinity says if you take any two numbers, a and b, in this set, so remember this little e symbol stands for is in, for any two numbers a and b in this positive interval set, if a is less than b, that needs to guarantee that f of a is greater than f of b. In other words, the function is going down. So, this is equivalent to just looking at the slope. We'll calculate the slope between two arbitrary points and show that it's a negative number. So we start by taking two numbers, a and b, in the interval. All right, so we have two numbers, a and b, and we know that they're both positive. So we go and we look at our function, and our function tells us that f of b would be equal to 1 over b, and f of a be equal to 1 over a. So if we were to calculate our slope, our average rate of change on the interval from a to b, this is simply the slope f of b minus f of a divided by b minus a. And we use our formula f of b, the output of f for an input of b is 1 over b, and the output of f with an input of a is 1 over a. And in order to finish this simplification, those fractions need a common denominator. So I need to multiply the first by a, and the second by b. And now I have a common denominator that I can factor out, a minus b divided by ba divided by b minus a. And a minus b and b minus a are the same except for a factor of negative 1. And what we found is that the slope given by the slope between the two points at a and b is equal to negative 1 over b a. Now we know that a and b are positive, so since a is positive and b is positive, negative 1 over a b must be negative. So our slope is negative. And that's what it means to be decreasing. So we reach our conclusion. And that finishes our proof. Problem 11 looks at the same function as problem 10. But this time it asks, it asks us to show that this function is concave up. And again, we need to use the definition. So we'll start by rev reviewing the definition. The definition of concavity is focused on the idea that the slope is increasing. And this requires three points. So we take three unspecified, we don't get to pick specific numbers, three unspecified points in our interval, put them in order, so a is less than b is less than c, and if I calculate the slope from a to b, the average rate of change from a to b, and I calculate the average rate of change from b to c, going from left to right, the slope has to be increasing. And that's our goal as we try to prove this. So as we go through our proof, we'll do exactly that. We'll start by taking three points. So we start with our three points. Each of them are positive numbers. We also 
want to calculate our slope. And we did that in the previous problem, so I'm not going to repeat that work. The slope, the average rate of change going from A to B, we discovered last time was negative 1 over B times A. In a similar way, if I were to find the average rate of change going from B to C, my A and B get turned into B and C, and I get negative 1 over C times B. And I need to show that the first slope, negative 1 over BA, is less than the second slope, negative 1 over CB. So I'm just going to put that to the side to remind myself of my goal. My goal is to show that negative 1 over BA is less than negative 1 over CB. Okay. When I, when I look at that, notice that most of the formulas are the same. Negative 1 over B and negative 1 over B appears in both inequality. At the same time, I know in advance that A is less than C. And so my, my proof is going to start by knowing that A is less than C and will create a, se a sequence of inequalities that are consequences that ultimately lead to the inequality I want. Okay, so what do we know? Let's change color. We know that A is positive and C is positive and even bigger than A. Well, one of the consequences of inequalities allows us to know that this implies that 1 over C is less than 1 over A. In other words, when you take reciprocals of positive numbers, the order switches. The, the larger sorry, the larger denominator creates a smaller fraction. And our goal, the reason we did this, is that our inequality has 1 over A and 1 over C in it. Okay, so the second step is we're going to multiply both sides by 1 over B. And 1 over B is positive. So 1 over BC is less than 1 over BA. And that's because B was a positive number. If I now change the sign, negative 1 over BC would be greater than negative 1 over BA because I multiplied by a negative number. And what we've now shown is that the average rate of change on the interval from B to C is greater than the average rate of change going from A to B. And that's the goal, that's the inequality that I wanted to show. And we reach our conclusion. Therefore, f of x is concave up on the interval 0 to infinity. And we're done. Problem 12 tells us to suppose that 2, 5 is a point on the graph y equals f of x for some function. And what that means is if I look at this point, uh, 2 is the input and 5 is the output for my function. So let's summarize that. So my function, if the input is 2, gives me an output of 5. And each of these problems can be interpreted in the language of input and output. In the first, my function, f, sees his input is x minus 3. And since I know that my original input was 2 and I have x minus 3, if I add 3, I get 5. In other words, there was a horizontal 
shift plus three. On the other hand, y is the output of my function plus four. And so the output of my function was five, my y value is nine, and what happened is I had a vertical shift plus four. Uh, shift up. And so the corresponding point that I'm working with is the point 5, 9. 5, 9 is on the graph y equals f of x minus 3 plus 4. Okay, on our second problem, my input is minus x. And so since my original input was 2, my input equals minus x, and 2 equals minus x, so x equals minus 2, what's happened to my graph is there's been a horizontal reflection. I've multiplied every x value by negative 1. And my y value is twice the output plus 3. And since my output was 5, my new output is 13. And so there's been a vertical stretch on the order of 2, followed by a shift plus 3. And my point is negative 2, 13 negative 2, 13 is on y equals twice f of minus x plus 3. For the third example, my input is negative 3x minus 1. So my input equals negative 3x minus 1. My original input was negative 2. So let's look through the steps. I'm going to add 1. Then I'll divide by negative 3, which includes both a reflection and a scaling. So horizontally, there was a shift plus 1, followed by a reflection and a scaling of dividing by a third. My y is the output minus 2. And so I start at 5, subtract 2, and I go to 3. So vertically, all I've done is there's been a shift vertically down 2. And my new point is 1, 3. 1, 3 is on the graph y equals f of negative 3x minus 1 minus 2. All right, the fourth example is the inverse function. And so the inverse function, inputs and outputs are reversed. So let's summarize that. The input of f was 2, that's the output of the inverse. The output of f was 5, that becomes the input of the inverse function. So the point that we get on the inverse function is where x and y switch places. 5, 2 is a point on the graph y equals the inverse function of x. Problem 13 is to use a table that defines two functions, f and g and we simply want to interpret it. So, the x row corresponds to the input of a function, f of x corresponds to the output coming from f, and g of x corresponds to the output coming from g. Our first question is, what is f of 2? Well, that means 2 is my input, so we find 2 on the input line, and then we go and find out what is the output of f, and we get the output of f is 1. So f of 2 equals 1. 
The second problem says find x so that the input of x gives an output of 2. So I now go to the output line and find 2, here it is, and I see what the input had to be. The input was negative 1. So x equals negative 1 because when you put negative 1 as an input you get an output of 2. The third question is a composition question. It says f composed with g with an input of negative 1. Well composition is the picture where you take your input it gets put into the function furthest to the right you get a value. That is then fed as the input to the next function to give me my final value. And we're told that the original input is negative 1. So we go to our table. Our input of negative 1, g gives us an output of 1. We now use 1 as our input for f, and we get an output of negative 1. And so what we found is f composed with g of negative 1 equals negative 1. Okay, our fourth question is similarly about composition. I have g as its output fed into f as the input, except this time we're told that the uh, final output is negative 1. Maybe this was a, a poor choice because this is exactly the problem above. Um, so how about we slightly modify it here and let's find out uh, what will give us a 2. Okay, this will be a little more interesting. Okay, so I go to my output and it's the output of f. So I want the output of f to be a 2. So I go, here's a 2. My input had to be negative 1. Okay, so our input was negative 1. And then that's the output of g. So I look for negative 1 on the g line. Here it is. And uh, my input had to be 2. So what we found is x equals 2, so that f composed with g with an input of x gives me 2. And this is sort of interesting that uh, I keep getting the same value. The last part tells us to do a, a new row. We're going to calculate all the values. f composed with g of x. Let's draw our line. And so this is going to be interpreted as uh, negative 3 is an input to g to give me 0. 0 is now the input to f, and I get a value of negative 3. Okay, negative 2 is the input to g. I get negative 3. Negative 3 is now the input to f. I get a value of negative 2. pattern might be starting to show up. f composed with g. Negative 1 is fed into g, give me 1. 1 is fed into f to give me negative 1. And if I do this for all the problems, lo and behold, I get the numbers in order. In other words, what I've discovered is f composed with g of x equals x. So the second part of this is to interpret our interpretation is that f and g are inverse functions. Because when I put them in composition I get back my input f composed with g of x equals x. 
Now officially I would need to do the uh, G composed with F as well. And um, we're, we're just going to save time and not do that. But it will in fact be equal to X for that as well. Problem 14 is essentially the same as problem 13, except I'm given a formula instead of a table. When calculating f composed with g of 2 means that I take the number 2, it's the input to the g function, I get an output, that's fed into f, and gives me my final output. So g of 2, when I use my formula, is 1 half of the input squared minus 1. And so that's a half of 4 is 2, 2 minus 1 is 1. So f composed with g of 2 is f of g of 2, and g of 2 we've just discovered is 1. And so I plug 1 into my formula for f, 2 times 1 plus 1 minus 3, I get a value of the square root of 3 minus 3. The second part, f composed with g of x, tells us to take the output of g and plug it into f, but this time we use formulas. And so f of g of x, my g of x has a formula 1 half x squared minus 1. This is what I put into my input of my square root function. So it's the square root of 2, 1 half x squared minus 1. That's my input, plus 1. And then I subtract 3. And now I simplify, so I need to, let's see, I need to distribute the 2. So I get this is equal to the square root of 2 times a half is x squared. So I get 1x squared times negative 1 is minus 2, so I get minus 1, minus 3. That doesn't simplify anymore. So my final answer, when I compose f and g and evaluate it at any x, I get the square root of x squared minus 1, and then I have to subtract 3.